interesting topic, focusing on global trends, best practices in crowd finance, and basically what 2015 and beyond holds. And our next speaker is Kun Jason Best, co-founder and principal of Crowd Fund Capital Advisor. Please join me in welcome, Mr. Jason. Thank you all uh, for, uh, for coming today. I appreciate the time. I wanted to, um, I was uh, having the slides kind of rearranged a bit during the break and, and adding a few things because I wanted to try to speak a bit about, kind of react to some of the really interesting comments and panels that we saw earlier today. I think they all had some really interesting comments, perspectives, questions, concerns. And so what I want to be able to do is try to um, talk about some of the things I had kind of scheduled, but also add in some, some comments and some thoughts based on those, those earlier conversations. So I'll be referring to my laptop a little bit just so I can refer to my notes uh, if I'm kind of back and forth on this. I can make the slides advance. I'm not sure if the, uh, this is working. It's not, the slides aren't advancing though. Um, well, anyway, I, I guess what I wanted to talk about to begin with is um, there are a lot of questions that came up around kind of how to think about this issue of crowdfunding and how to, uh, a lot of questions around how do we structure it? How do we get the rules right so that it works? How are we able to, uh, you know, put in place a regime that makes sense. And so one of the things that we've done at CCA is, is use a, what we call a balanced stakeholder framework. And so really it, it, there are kind of four audiences that you really have to balance the needs of when you're trying to you know, utilize crowd finance and crowdfunding. Um, and really, number one, you have to protect investors. I think that's been a, a common theme throughout all of the, uh, the conversations that we've seen so far. Um, number two, you have to be able to provide capital to, um, now it's on, now it works, you have to provide capital to businesses. So you have to be able to make the process easy enough for those businesses to raise the capital so they'll actually use the, the, use the process. And I think that's one of, the, one of the points that the Securities Commission has been very clear on and it's very uh, it's, it's excellent that they have been clear on the fact that they want to do this process and do, they've done all this work and they want it to work. They want it to function effectively. And so balancing out how do we protect investors at the same time, making it easy enough uh, so that the companies can actually use this process efficiently. So that a startup or an SME uh, of you know, one or five or 10 employees can use this kind of, of tool. Three, you need transparency for the regulator. Uh, critically important. One of the things that uh, Doug Elinoff talks about uh, when he talks about crowd finance is uh, it's not really about can crowdfunding do regulate, can crowdfunding regulation be as effective in transparency as the original kind of legacy uh, funding mechanisms, the traditional markets, but how can we do it better? And with crowdfunding, he believes, and I share his belief, that we can do it better with, uh, with crowdfunding. Because all of this data, the valuation, the cost, the price, all the due diligence, is all, are all in databases. It's all in a database. And when it's in a database, you can, it, it's available then you know, in, in near real time. And so then you, uh, the regulator has the opportunity to receive a data feed on a regular basis and analyze that data in a standardized way and be able to understand exactly what's happening in this segment of the private capital markets. Uh, I think in most countries, the private capital markets are fairly opaque. It's fairly difficult to understand what's really happening uh, right away, much less even, even within six to 12 months following a transaction because of the way in which those, those uh, documents are passed. And so if there were a common way that the data from crowdfunding issues were transmitted on a regular basis so that the regulator could know on, a, let's say, a quarterly basis what was happening on each crowdfunding platform, then there's a, a great way to have access to this data and understand what's happening. So what we want to do, what we suggest, 
is work creating a regime that is what we call data intensive, but prescriptively light. This ability to say, how do we use this data in new and better ways? And we, we can provide you know, a, a full regulation, but do it in a way that allows us to modulate or modify the regulation over time. So after the regulation, kind of version one of the regulation is complete, with this data on a regular basis, it allows the regulator to either tighten or loosen the regulation based on what they need and have the data to back up why they're making that decision. And so it can be really helpful and really effective. And then third, enablement, fourth, enablement for platforms. And by enablement for platforms, what I mean is every platform has to, have, it has to be a profitable, successful business. And it can't have so much regulation and so much overhead involved that the business you know, can't be profitable and grow and be successful. Uh, and scale it was across Thailand or across Southeast Asia. And so we certainly want to have uh, those opportunities. Um, you know, we see kind of three different kinds of uh, macro trends that are growing, that are, that are driving this change. Um, you know, first, the opportunity to, um, the, the online marketplaces create efficiency. All you have to do is look at play things like Uber and Airbnb to see how an online marketplace can take uh, inventory and need and do a better job of matching that in real time. Second, there's been a lot of talk about social media and how it's driving innovation and how it's driving adoption. Uh, several of the uh, pitches last night were centered around the utilization of social media. Uh, and obviously, uh, as with the earlier speakers discussed, it's changed all aspects of our lives. I think that from my perspective, finance is sort of the latest area of our lives that, is, that social media is changing. And so it's something that we need, that, that this is an opportunity to take that and make it happen. And third, really, that, that we've seen successes in the market already uh, in crowd finance and other markets. So you know, one example is a uh, crowdfunding platform in the US called Seed Invest. They raised 50% of their Series A funding on um, a crowd, their own crowdfunding site. Crowdcube in the UK raised their entire Series A on their own site in less than two weeks. Um, and then also we've had our first IPO on the NASDAQ from a crowdfunded company. Uh, it was an Israeli company that was called Rewalk. It's created an, a, an exoskeleton, a uh, basic of robotic legs to allow people who could not walk before to walk. And they have been now been able to, uh, gone, they've gone public and gone public successfully on NASDAQ after they've raised a Series A and moved forward. So the bottom line is, you know, the ecosystem is forming. And we're seeing, we already have a number of crowdfunding platforms today. But what we're also seeing is the fact that there will be a whole series of companies that are need to be created in order to make this efficient system. Earlier today, we, they talked about questions around, you know, what are the, um, how will, how will you handle you know, 100 investors or 1,000 investors? How will you handle the compliance issues? How will you do due diligence? How will you have legal services and accounting and transfer and title uh, and escrow services? Well, over time, we'll have to have new companies to create new models of doing those things. So example is, when is the last time any of you walked into a travel agency to buy an airplane ticket? Um, because 20 years ago, people said it was an incredibly difficult and, 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 and highly scientific process to buy an airline ticket that no, one, no consumer could ever do it themselves. And now we just go to the web and buy our own tickets all the time. In a lot of markets, you also can buy and sell stock online. And so, and so these, you know, the, the role of the stockbroker has changed. They, they have more specialized, they're doing larger transactions, and retail investors can typically make a lot of their own decisions. Um, this, is, this, this is the same thing. This is another example of how technology has now evolved to the point where crowd finance is possible. Um, secondly, it's, you know, we, we've seen this before. It's, it's, it's still early days. And much like, like the online advertising world, where we'd seen in the past, um, we, this evolved. First of all, you had people selling and buying and selling online banner ads. Then you had marketplaces where you could have those ads to buy, be bought and sold. 
then you had the opportunity to say, well, I, I wonder if my ads are being clicked on. I wonder if anybody is reading these ads. I wonder if anyone's buying as a result. So you had to have analytics packages. And then you had have to have networks so you could make it a more efficient place to buy and sell. So all these things are just, it, so this is an example of how online advertising sort of grew into a multi-billion dollar industry uh, because of this, uh, with a whole constellation of companies around it. The same thing will be true in crowd finance because the opportunity is so large. Um, you know, as far as key themes for this year, um, you know, I think that what we've seen are economic uh, competition and economic need in a lot of markets has, have moved regulators from the, the standpoint of not what is crowdfunding, but how do I implement it in my market? Um, you know, in, in a number of markets, Malaysia, Singapore, here, uh, Hong Kong even, uh, the regulator is looking at these questions. Uh, I think Hong Kong is going to move um, more slowly than the rest of those markets, but uh, you know, their organizations are making these decisions, they're monitoring these developments, and are taking it seriously. Whereas a year ago, they uh, you know, did not know really much about crowdfunding at all. So I think that um, the, the need to drive SME development, the need to drive more entrepreneurship in a country is not unique to Thailand or to Southeast Asia. It's a global issue. It's, it's what we talk about and what we hear is needed in every country we work in. And so this, you know, we think crowd finance is a piece of the solution for that. You know, this, like I mentioned earlier, the crowdfunding technology, the platforms themselves, it's kind of the first wave. There'll be a whole lot of other technology solutions that are created over time. And not just for crowdfinance, but I think we'll see some of these solutions that are created for crowdfunding that will have broader application in the rest of the private capital markets. So for example, one of the things that was discussed earlier is angel investing and what are, how are angels gonna react to this and how will angel investors and crowdfunders work together. And I think that what we've seen in a lot of markets is that's that is, uh, the opinions about that have changed over time. Whereas a couple of years ago, like I mentioned I think yesterday, a couple of years ago, there were a lot of concerns about how angels would, would work with VCs or how angels would work with crowdfunders. And now we're seeing a lot of collaboration. In fact, angel groups may see a pitch from an entrepreneur and say, you know what, go try crowdfunding first, prove you've got some people behind you, prove that you can raise some money from people that you know, and then come back and let's talk about it. And so it's being used as another way to reduce risk for angel investors. I mean, this, this conversation about, you know, wow, you know, the, the crowd and what do they know and, and uh, dumb money and, and all this kind of stuff, it's a lot of the same comments that you can read if you go back and look at what VC said about angel investors 20 years ago. And what, if you go back another 20 years, what you know, institutional investors were saying about VCs. And what we're seeing is this is just because, and what you can track over that period of time is that information has become easier and easier to, to but more, more liquid, right? You have the ability to have access to more information to more people. And so you're able to get access to information and make better decisions. So more people can make better decisions about their own financial lives. And so this is just empowering that opportunity. Uh, this really leads into the hybridization of funding. This opportunity for uh, angels and VCs to work together using crowdfunding technology. Being able to use the, the technology that allows you to look at a lot of deals, see uh, the deal technology, understand what's happening, and then be able to um, apply it to the, what they're, own, they're doing themselves. The global market for this uh, technology really is a trillion dollar market. That comes from Charles Muldo of Foundation Capital in Silicon Valley. And uh, you know, he's, uh, that's sort of debt and equity crowdfunding. Uh, he's, his, uh, he believes that the majority of that is debt crowdfunding. I, I think that's right. I think that equity crowdfunding may be slower growing. I think that over time it becomes very large. Uh, it's slower, it, I can see why debt is so easy because it, everyone can see what your return is. And it's traditionally better understood investing product. I give you 100, I give you, you know, I give you 10,000 baht and I get 11,000 baht back in two years, right? I know what my interest rate is. Uh, but it's, that's kind of the, that, that's kind of this model. 
equity is a, is a much more, it, it's higher risk, much less certainty of return. All, you know, majority of them will fail. But I think that that's also where these, this ecosystem of crowdfunding comes in. The fact that you'll have an, as the tools get better for doing due diligence and having better transparency and having more access to information, that will allow, I believe, more companies to be funded more successfully. There was a question yesterday around the success rates and, and is 47% success rate a good number or not? Uh, I would suggest it's a great number. That's thousands of additional entrepreneurs that were able to get funding to start their businesses than would have ever had access to that before. Um, you know, and I know that earlier this morning there were some, some comments that were, you know, well, maybe there's, you know, there's, maybe these companies should really be more appropriate to go to traditional investors. They can go to angels, they can go to VCs, and they can get the money. Well, there are absolutely a small number of people in every country who have phone numbers or email addresses of the angel investors or the VCs in that country. The vast majority of people don't. And that's really the power of this. If you really want to, you know, if, if you only want the same people to be able to access capital again over and over, then there's no need to change. If you want to open it up and allow more entrepreneurs, a greater number of people to access capital, then that's where this really becomes very powerful. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of what we're really passionate about is trying to make this available to more people. And, you know, even if you have, even if the success rates are 30%, that's a lot, of more, a lot more entrepreneurs who are able to get started and who have a chance of, of making a successful company. Um, the work that we did with the World Bank uh, really looked at, at developing market, developing economy markets. And over the next 10 to 15 years, it's, it's over 90 billion US dollars. So it's a, it's a significant market. And Asia was a huge part of that. Um, and so really, it's, it's, it's about you know, becoming a leader in the market. And it's about the opportunity for Thailand to be a regional, regional leader in the space. Uh, there was been talk, and I, I, I was one of the people who talked about it yesterday, about a you know, Thailand crowdfunding association, an Asian crowdfunding association. Those are important. A couple of people during the break uh, yesterday said, isn't that just overhead? Isn't that, a, isn't that just, you know, what's the value of having a crowdfunding association? It's really significant value, actually. Number one, it allows the regulator to have a single entity to talk to about the industry because you want to have one voice, which makes a much more efficient conversation, which will yield better regulation for everyone. Two, it allows for, it reduces fraud possibilities because then if someone's in the association, they're a, a real company, they're a real platform. If they're not, then they're not. And it allows for better collaboration on data standards because I think it, it's incumbent on the, the industry in Thailand to come up with a data standard that they can agree to, that they can then transmit that data on a regular basis to the regulator that ensures that the, that transparency exists. You know, it's, it's, it's really funny. I, I, my background is not a regulator. I'm not an attorney. I'm, I'm not an accountant. Uh, I'm a tech entrepreneur who's had to, you know, learn how to speak a different language of regulation and understand why it's important and why it's valuable. And so, you know, it's, 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 it's new, new territory. Um, those are the slides that I had prepared. I mean, I, I wanted to keep it really focused and really brief because I want to, you know, make a couple more points from my notes from earlier this morning. And then if there are questions, I'm happy to answer any. Um, I think that there, you know, the thing to, the thing to consider uh, with, you know, how to get this market started, what are some of the opportunities for governments to consider? There, there are, the UK government has done some really interesting co-investment uh, kinds of things that, are, that are, are really interesting. Number one, they are on both debt and equity platforms. In certain industries, are taking the last 20 or 30 percent of, of an equity issue or of a loan in a business. So if you as an entrepreneur are able to raise 80 percent of your need, then you're able to then, the government kicks in or adds the last 20 percent. And so that can be a really powerful way for them to not only support the market, but it also reduces the government's risk in having to make the decision about who's, um, who's the best company to invest in, because the crowd is helping to make that decision. Um, and really, I guess I would just say that the 
forming these regulations does take work and it takes time. And that I think that it's just a matter of, um, there's been a lot of great work done here and there, there's more work to do. And that it's just, it, 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 once it's done and the opportunity to then keep it in a way that allows for the industry to continue to have input, to continue to innovate, to continue to, to, to modify will be really helpful. Another uh, government program that the UK has put into place is a, a tax uh, benefit for making investments in small businesses. It allows you to write off 50%, deduct 50% of your investment in SMEs in the first year. It allows you to write off 75% of your uh, losses if you lose the money. And also makes the gain, if you do get a gain on the, on the SME investment, tax free. So, you know, it's a very powerful stimulus opportunity to drive investment into the space. Does it need to go on forever? Maybe not. But maybe it's a program that goes on for, you know, the first three to five years to get, allow the market to gain some traction, to, to see what happens, and have enough of a runway to kind of get off the ground. I think one to two years is not long enough, uh, but, uh, you know, more like five years could be really, really beneficial. But, you know, I think that I'm really excited about what I've seen here. Um, as I mentioned before, I, I'm, I'm a frequent visitor to Thailand, and so I'm excited that um, the opportunity to work in crowdfunding here uh, overlaps with my interests in, in the region. And so thank you again for the opportunity to be here, and if there's any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Um, any questions from the floor? Please raise your hands. All right. we, we've had a long day. We have indeed. Thank you all very much. <laughs>